excited to have uh, Life Tree Fellowship and Pastor Garrett with us this morning, and we're going to be uh, co-teaching, co-preaching this morning, and uh, Garrett's going to going to start out. Why don't you just give Garrett, Pastor Garrett, a warm welcome and Life Tree, Amen. Praise the Lord. God is good. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. He's alive. Amen. Have you heard? He's alive. <laughs> Praise the Lord. How many of you, uh, I just wanted to see, I didn't see when uh, uh, Ron C. had asked how many had been here Friday night, but how many came through the Good Friday experience Friday? Just want to kind of eyeball you a little bit. All right, so it's a lot of you, but not all of you. So what I'm going to do this morning, uh, for starters, is kind of uh, bring you up to speed on everything that we've been experimenting um, before I start, you know, with, with uh, Pastor David and myself teaching, I mean, you got two pastors. We promise you will be out of here by about 4 o'clock this afternoon. <laughs> something, something in that zone, all right? Praise the Lord. You know, I, I actually stuck to my notes on Friday because, you know, we wanted to be really timed and sensitive to people. And uh, I said to our treasurer afterwards, I said, you know, I really stuck by my notes. Did you see how quickly I got out? And her response was, oh, so you're saying it can be done? I didn't like that. All right. Praise the Lord. Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 through 38. This is kind of where our experience started on Friday. It says, Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. How many could even, I, I mean, we probably can't really imagine, but how many can, can try to imagine what Jesus was feeling in these moments? You see, Jesus knew the scriptures beginning to end. I, I'm sure he had the whole thing memorized. You know, a lot of rabbis in that first century, they had the whole Old Testament memorized. It was not uncommon uh, for, for them to have that all pegged to memory. And, and of course, the Lord, he knew every prophecy of what was going to happen to him. He knew exactly what was coming, and so here he's approaching, he's just like a few hours away from this torture and death and betrayal by a close friend, Judas, you know, and uh, he, this begins to weigh on him heavily. And as we pass through the first sanctuary, the historic sanctuary, uh, it was kind of just a, 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 a quiet, you know, uh, feel in there. The, the team did an amazing job decorating. If you didn't see it yet, go in there after service and just get a, get a little feel of, of what that was all about. And uh, up on the stage, you know, a couple of the disciples were sleeping there, and then uh, Jesus w was by this big rock, and he was praying, you know, and just, uh, there wasn't a lot, there wasn't any real drama of speaking or anything, but just to give that impression of what it must have been like as he was praying. There's one little girl from our church, um, her name's Molly, she's about four or five years old, and she was waiting, and, and, and they got there early, and I said, now keep watching, because Jesus is going to be in there pretty soon, you know, and she was all excited about that. Well, I heard afterwards, you know, she, she was like, can I, she was asking her grandparents, can I go up to him? You know, I just want to tell him how much I love him. <laughs> is that beautiful? You know, as people went through this experiment, experience, whether you were a four or five-year-old or, or an adult or whatever, uh, as they passed through that garden of Gethsemane, and Pastor David brought out how Gethsemane means oil press, you know, and you can see how, how the Lord's uh, heart was being pressed, you know, and his soul was, was vexed within him. But as we passed through there, we came into the next uh, area of the gallery, and it was set up so that the cross was in there. And as you came in, there was a Roman soldier, and he gave you a nail, Got that nail right up here, you know, pretty cool looking nail. And, and you, you would take this nail, and as you went through the line, you would come up to the cross. And, and the idea is, what, what is it that you need to put to death in your life? What is it that needs to be finished in you? What, what is it that needs to be put to the cross? And many of you took your nail and hammered that into the cross. One person said to me that uh, they didn't expect it. Well, as they actually got up there and began to put the nail in there, they just saw it as if putting it in, in Christ's hand, and it was a very moving experience. My wife was at the door where people were coming out, and uh, many of them weeping and just overwhelmed with, with what the Lord has done for them. You know, this is such a time, you know, especially Good Friday, such a time to think about uh, all that the Lord has done and what he went through for you and I. As we pass then through into this sanctuary, we had a, a joint service together. And uh, I want to read to you Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5. 
This is a prophecy of, of what the Lord would go through. It says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. How many believe that this morning? How many know that that is the Christ that we serve? That is the Messiah that we love and that we, we give our heart to and the one that went through so much for us. The theme of, of what we talked about as we were in, the, in this service together on Friday is everybody was given a seed when they came in. There's a little, little bowl of the seed still up here. Everybody was given a seed and uh, just had to hold on to it through the service. And we eventually got to the point uh, of explaining what this seed was for. Pastor David uh, invited everybody to come up. And these planters were all empty except for soil in there. And he asked the question, you know, what needs to be finished in your life? What needs to be finished? And, and people came up, and as a prophetic symbol, they took this seed and they planted it into the planter, burying that. You know, and Jesus is actually called the seed in Galatians chapter 3. You know, it's a picture of his life, of, of his death being buried in the ground. You know, we talked about, uh, you know, with actual seeds, the idea of germination. You know, something has to die for new life to come forth. Do you know that concept? How many of you eat meat? I hate to break it to you. Something had to die for your life to go on. How many of you uh, just eat vegetables? Yeah, two of you? What? <laughs> what? What's going on? <laughs> Come on, your mother taught you eat your vegetables. You know, you don't have to, to eat the asparagus, you know, as your main vegetable, uh, uh, whatever it's called. Anyways, so Jesus said here in John chapter 12, 23, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, but he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him, my father, will honor. Now soul, my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Jesus knew the plan. Jesus, that was, you know, his part of his strategy, wasn't it? That he would come and, and conquer death, hell, and the grave, and that he would rise again and give us the power of life. You know, as we buried those things, I mean, look at the new life that we see represented here this morning in, in these beautiful lilies and flowers. You know, it's such a picture of what the Lord wants to do in your heart today. Pastor David finished with this great statement. He had us all repeat it with vim and vigor. It is finished. It is finished. And what is finished? He talked about it. He said the Savior's plan was complete. Satan's power was finished. Sin's penalty was paid for. The scriptural prophecies had come into fruition. And then he asked the question, again, what needs to be finished in your life? And even this morning, maybe you haven't asked this question this weekend, what needs to be finished in your life? When Jesus uttered those words, he was declaring the debt owed to his father was wiped away completely and forever. And what was that debt? It was the debt of our sin. It was the debt that we owed because the wages of sin were death. That prophetic act of bearing the seed. It was an idea of leaving our will at the cross, leaving our sin at the cross, a symbol of new birth, new life, New beginning, our old way of doing things coming to an end. How many know it is finished? Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Tag. Tag team. Where's the baton? <laughs> I hear a heartbeat. What is that? Is that somebody's heartbeat? All right. Am I on? doesn't sound like it. Can you hear me? All right. Um, you know, today we celebrate Christ's resurrection. And it was Christ that died on the cross, but he didn't die on the cross for himself. He died on the cross 
for us. So his, his death, his crucifixion was about us. His resurrection, yes, he rose from the dead, but his resurrection was about us also so that we would have life and we'd have it more abundantly. You know, we, we planted these, these seeds that we were actually given were, were pea seeds. And pea seeds don't turn into lilies and flowers, they turn into pea plants. So, but, but this isn't some sort of miracle. Um, volunteers came in after everybody was gone and they, and they put, these, put these in the plot, uh, pot. And those of you who weren't, weren't here, we're going to have you come up and get a seed after the service. So you can, you can just kind of drop it in the soil uh, among, among all these flowers. But, you know, the miracle isn't this. The miracle is you. The miracle is you. You know, you sons and daughters of God whose lives have been transformed by, by following the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You're, you are that miracle. But just like a seed being planted in soil... It needs to be planted in soil. It needs to be planted in good soil if it's going to grow. If you just throw it on the carpet, it's not going to grow. If you just throw it out in the parking lot, it's not going to grow. Weeds grow really good in parking lots. They grow really good on sidewalk cracks, but not good stuff, not good plants. Well, our lives are the same way. We have to be planted in good soil. You know, we're we're going to talk about the parable of the sower, the parable of the seed, because it represents our life. It represents us on this, on this journey. Uh, if you want to open up your Bibles to Matthew 3, I'm going to just read this so you can follow along on the screen. I think it's a good practice to bring your Bible to church. Actually, not just to church, to carry it around wherever you go. It's a representation of the book that you believe in, the way that you walk. But in, uh, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 3 and 9, It says, Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them, But others fell on the good ground and yielded a good crop. Some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear, let him hear. And then a little bit further down in that chapter in verse 18, he explains the parable. Jesus often spoke in parables. And matter of fact, about this parable, parable with regarding this parable, he says in scripture, if you don't understand this parable, you won't understand any of the other ones. So it's really important for you to grasp this parable. So here's the explanation of the parable. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who has received the seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on the stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet, He has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation and persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, he becomes unfruitful. But he who received the seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bear fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some 60, and some 30. There are three elements in this parable. I mean, the soil jumps right out, but there are two other elements that we can't ignore. Not, a, not much is said about them, but they're very important. The story wouldn't be complete without them. You have the sower. There's no seed sown if there's no sower. So the sower is important. doesn't really explain what the sower is, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But then there's the seed that's sown. The seed is the word. It's the truth. It's Jesus Christ. It's what he's done. It's the gospel. And then there's the soil. It elaborates quite a bit on the soil, but I want to share a little bit about the sower. I think the reason why it doesn't really specifically define the sower, because the sower could be anybody. I believe the sower is God. This fits so appropriately with with receiving communion this morning. I found this 
quote, and I wanted to work it in one of my messages one of these days, and I, and I managed to put it in here. But listen to this. This is so profound. God is the sower. He sowed himself through his son into our lives. It's really easy to separate the Trinity. God in three persons. God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But they truly are one. It wasn't just Jesus that died on the cross. Listen to this. This is from Pastor Brian Zand. So let's be clear. The cross is not about the appeasement of a monster God. The cross is about the revelation of a merciful God. At the cross, we discover a God who would rather die than kill his enemies. The cross is where God in Christ absorbs sin and recycles it into forgiveness. The cross is not what God inflicts upon Christ in order to forgive. The cross is what God endures in Christ as he forgives. Once we understand this, we know what we are seeing when we look at the cross. We are seeing the lengths of which a God of love will go to forgive sin. The cross is both ugly and beautiful. It's as ugly as human sin, and it's as beautiful as divine love. But in the end, love and beauty win. Like Pastor Ron said earlier, you know, Jesus wins. We win. There are some battles we might lose here, but ultimately we win. We're winners. Jesus is a winner. He's victorious. Another sower could be Jesus. We know this because Jesus sowed his truth into us. And now it might have been by a person that witnessed to you. It might have been by picking up a Bible. You might have heard something on TV or on the radio. But Jesus is a sower, and he sows his living word in us. Jesus is called the word. He is the living word. He makes the written word alive. Jesus is alive in us. He brings the gospel that brings hope and joy. I mean, you've read through the gospels. You know how Jesus walked through the villages and he, and he, demons were cast out. People were healed. They came to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Tell me you would not experience joy if you were bleeding since you could last remember or you had leprosy, or you were blind, and everybody thought that you were cursed because you were blind. Could you imagine when Jesus came and said, I came to give you life and give it more abundantly? Or like the thief that was hanging on the cross next to Jesus, and Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Do you imagine the joy that wells up in your heart? You know, many of you know, the joy that welled up in your heart when when you first decided to follow Christ Maybe you initially thought you were giving up something, but when you gave your heart to Christ, you gained everything, right? Hope, joy, peace. Another sower is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit inspires and empowers the sowers of the seed. We would not be able to sow seed if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit that's in us. When we get saved, God puts his spirit in us and it empowers us for ministry. It gives us courage for ministry. It gives us courage to open up our mouth and share the gospel. It gives us courage to walk over and lay hands on somebody and command them to be healed in Jesus' name. The, the, the Holy Spirit is sowed into our lives to make that possible. He waters the sown seed. He makes the word of God, the truth, alive. It's the Holy Spirit that makes it alive. We read the words, we take them in our mind, and it begins to work in our mind, it begins to work in our hearts, it begins to work in our spirit, and begins to transform us. That transformation takes place because the Holy Spirit's in you. God's spirit is in you, transforming you. He brings seeds of conviction. Believers still get convicted, don't they? You still get convicted? You know, we struggle with stuff. We have bad thoughts. We say terrible things. The Holy Spirit convicts us. He's living in us. He's not real happy with that. We can grieve the Holy Spirit that's in us. And then we repent of those things and we move on. And he he continues that transformation process. Every Christian should be a sower. Not every Christian is a sower. I mean, as, we, as is demonstrated in the parable, people receive it, they, they discount it, they take it for granted, and they walk away from their faith. You know, many Christians are not sowers. We, we need to be vigilant sowers. We need to be sowers of God's word. He says, go and make disciples of the nations. You know, he teaches us to teach what the apostles taught to teach the word and the truth. We have to do that verbally, but we also have to do it in works. It's not just about a spoken word. It's not just about a written word. It's about the works. The Holy Spirit enables the works. It says the Holy Spirit came to give us power, power from on high 
That power in us helps us do those works. It's simple acts of kindness. It's generosity. It's God's love. Those are sowers. The seed, of course, is the word of the kingdom that Jesus teaches us. It's the word of God. It's the gospel is the seed that changes dead things to living things. You know what I'm talking about if you're a believer. You know the dead things that you pursued in the past that made you empty. When Jesus came into your life, all of a sudden, everything looked different. Everything felt different. Relationships were different. He made things alive. He opened up your mind. He opened up your spirit. He moved you. He changed you. Yeah. This is, thank you, Jesus. The written word testifies of the living word. It's not just a historical book, even though there are historical facts. It's not just a love letter, even though it is a love letter to us. It's more than that. It's the living word of God. What book can you read? Can thousands and thousands and millions upon millions of people read and have it radically change their lives? I know murderers who were saved in their different people. I know rapists who were saved in their different people. Drug addicts that were freed in their different people. They have truly been transformed. Now, sometimes, sometimes the church has trouble with them. Certainly the world does. They don't see them as new. But when they get saved, God sees them as new. They're a new creation in Christ Jesus. The soil. First, let me say this about the soil. I want you to picture the soil as different conditions of the heart. It first talks about the wayside here. This is, this is that seed that was sown on the wayside. Never had an opportunity to, to take root. It's like taking seed and throwing it out in the parking lot on a hot summer day. It's just going to burn up. You know, it's the, it's the believer who has a closed mind. Maybe they hear it. Maybe they receive it. It tickles their fancy a little bit. Ah, oh, maybe I could use this. I can't use that. That's the believer that... It, the truth never sticks with them because they really never take it into their lives and absorb it into their mind. They never take God's truth and, 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 and apply it to their life and live it out. They receive the seed by ear, but no life springs forth. It's just another philosophy. It's a, just another proverb. It's not the living word of Jesus Christ. It represents those who are destitute of spiritual perception. You know, maybe they... They're moved by the song. They're moved by the altar call. They come up and they, they make a decision because, you know, they feel bad because they got busted or they got found out or they got, they, they got discovered. But it never really takes root. It's just burned off. As soon as they walk out of this place, they run back to their old life. It never stays, never sticks. They may even be regular attenders, but the seed never fills their soul. How many of you know your soul is your mind, your will, and emotions? That seed, that truth has to come into your life and it has to transform all of those things. And it can. Many of you know you've experienced trauma in your life like that little baby is experiencing right now. We <laughs> deliver that child, Lord. See, a lot of us feel that way when we come to church, but we're too embarrassed to cry like that. <laughs> They may be regular attenders, but it never fills the soul. It never changes the thoughts. It never changes your emotions. It never really brings true healing because we don't absorb it or they don't absorb it. It says the wicked one comes and he snatches this seed or he snatches the heart away through temptations of self-pleasure and grandeur. It's, it's, it's a believer that gets saved that never gives up his old life. He says, I want a little of Jesus so I can feel better but I'm not willing to surrender and really make him Lord of my life. There's a lot of people in church like that today. The next one is the stony ground hearer. He has an emotional mind. Easily excited and enthusiastic, but their faith has a thin surface. When temptation and persecution arise, they quickly backslide. They're very close to being that wayside heart or that wayside seed. They take it in. They recognize that there's something in me that's incomplete. I need something. And I think I need Jesus. And I'm going to make a decision today to follow him. And maybe they crack open their Bible once a year. 
They brush off the snow. It looks like snow because they barely read it. It's really dust. But they brush it off every once in a while. You know, they'll come to church and like for the fast, we fast at the beginning of the year and they're thinking, man, I really need to make that change. You know, it's the beginning of the year, I need to make a New Year's resolution and they start to make that change and they're good for about a month. They might read, you know, a few times a week and then once a week and and once a month. And, you know, they're never really sharing their life. They're still involved in the same stuff. You know, eventually that root, even though it started to sprout, it's just going to die. Because, because that root isn't getting into the, the deep things of God, into the, into the meat. It doesn't, it doesn't take root. They have, they have superficial character because it's in a shallow layer of earth. And when the trial of heavy rain comes, the seed is washed away. Like growth in the cracks of a sidewalk, shallow roots. The only thing that grows well in shallow roots is weeds. And weeds never represent good plants, ever. Even in spiritual terms or physical terms, we don't like weeds. But if a, if a seed, a good seed, gets planted in the crack of a sidewalk, there's a little bit of dirt there, it'll eventually die when temptation comes. And they'll eventually leave because they won't be fulfilled because they never allowed the truth to take root. Pastor Garrett. So we have four soils that Jesus gives as these examples of each one of us. Everybody sitting here, you're going to be one of these four. You kind of have to uh, do a little reflection and ask yourself, well, who am I? What is my tendency? What do I kind of tend towards? Um, let me share this little funny story before I go a little further. I was talking with a, a couple in our church. They've done a lot of children's ministry uh, at a church out in the Buffalo area. And they were teaching on this parable. And um, uh, they had long services there, so they had a lot of time to do things with the kids. And they brought in different, uh, I don't know, my idea, what I understood from the story, like construction paper and different things so that they could create this parable and they could like dress up as the different parts and then they would act it out. You know, just in children's church, there was a big, bigger children's church. And um, one of the boys was so enthusiastic, about first grader or something. He got so into his part. When church was over, he went outside uh, out to his parents in the foyer and he was running around. He had played one of the birds that came and swept down and took the seed uh, you know, from that wayside, you know, and so he's running around out in the, in the foyer with all the people after church, and he's running around saying, I'm a demon bird, I'm a demon bird, I'm a demon bird, you know, and, and his parents are like, what are they teaching in there, you know, and I, 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 I just found that hilarious, but I want to talk to you about starting here with the thorny soil. Matthew chapter 13, 22 says, now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. You know, it's like each of these soils, there's a similarity leading into the next type of soil. It's like somebody comes a little further. When you look at these, the, fir the first seed that was sown on the wayside, nothing really comes of it, right? Because it's not planted in anything. The next one that is sown, there's a, a little bit in the stony ground, so it can, it can at least shoot up like a little bit of a shoot. There's that excitement, and it, and it comes up, but there's not enough there to, to give it life and for it to really get rooted. Well, this third one, the way I see it is in the thorny soil, this is someone who actually takes a bit of root. This is actually one who actually begins to grow in, in their faith and their understanding of God. You know, it's not just like a flash in the pan kind of person. But what does Jesus say? I mean, this person received the word. You know, that, that idea of germination, germination begins, you got this dried out seed. Germination begins after you plant it, once water hits that. It begins to hydrate the seed and then all of the enzymes and things that are within the seed uh, begin to, to break out into life and, and a root begins to come out and then the shoot comes up. You know, and it, it, that idea of, of water, you know, uh, as Pastor David hit on, is, is the word of God. Romans chapter 10, 17, I love this verse, says, So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You know, when, when you hear the Word of God, everybody here is sitting and, and listening to the Word of God. Your faith may be stirred up right now. 
Uh, but what comes after that stirring of faith is you need to put action to your faith. You know, we had people come down and plant the seed because that was an action that they could do, uh, you know, as that prophetic symbol of what God was really doing on the inside of them. And so here, the, there's a person who has taken root, they have begin to grow, but Jesus warns here, what happens? There's two things that come against this guy. The cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. The cares of this world, you know, I, I get the idea that this is somebody who, um, it could be a lot of things that you would say are the cares of this world. It could be somebody who's driven by fear. You don't have to raise your hand, but, but um, there may be some of you in here that you have a tendency, if there was a sin that you fell into a lot in your walk, it's the sin of fear. You worry all the time. I heard one preacher talk about uh, his mother and his grandmother. He said they were world-class worriers. They could win any award if there was a contest for worrying. They'd have the gold medal, right? And, and, and he grew up that way too, and he said he had to be delivered from that so that he, he could step into a position of faith and trusting the Lord. You know, uh, that idea of worry or that, that sin of worry and fear, it leads us away from trusting God, who God is, his arms are out, and he's saying, look, I've got everything under control. No matter how crazy things look right now, I've got it under control, Trust in me. I'll work it out to your good because you love me and because you're called according to my purpose. And, but there's people who are just, just filled with phobias. There's other people who are pleasure seekers. You know, that word hedonism, hedonistic people. Uh, this, this whole world, even, even a Christian, somebody could be growing as a Christian, but things in this world can, can gain their attention and, and they can seek after what makes me happy. This is usually more of an emotional uh, type person who is very moved by their feelings. You know, to be people of God, we have to see what the Word of God says, and we have to decide, I am going to adhere my life to these promises and to these commands and, and to live a life of integrity. But if you live your life by, well, this morning I feel like praising God, you know, that's a good day. You know, but this, this morning, man, you know, I, you know, I'm just angry at God, you know, and you're just like wishy-washy in the way you go through life. You're going you're gonna to be hard, uh, in a hard place to see life grow in you. And so the cares of this world, you know, another thing, people who are, are caught up, their whole identity is in their job or their career or their title or their position or becoming famous or being known. All of those things are the cares of this world that are going to choke out the life of a believer, even one that has root and is beginning to grow. The second thing Jesus said, besides the cares of this world, is the deceitfulness of riches. The deceitfulness of riches. I mean, I think that's something that every person can relate to. You know, money, people say money makes the world go round. You know, and uh, you know, the Bible has a lot to say about money. That's not really what we're preaching on this morning. You know, but there are a lot of promises around finances, and there are a lot of warnings around finances and there's a balance and there's an understanding your heart has to be in the right place you know proverbs is all about becoming wise godly wisdom and what happens when godly wisdom comes on you it leads to prospering but if you don't have the godly wisdom and you're driven by your flesh and the cares of this world and what makes me happy you will have things so upside down jesus said or i think paul might have said that some have pierced themselves through because of the deceitfulness of riches and chasing finances it's i actually got the verse right here first timothy chapter 6 verse 10 i'm glad i told myself to say that <laughs> for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows you know a lot of people misquote that i've heard that misquoted a lot in my life you know people say well you know money is the root of all evil it's like, well, how can you do anything if you don't have money? That's not what the scripture is saying. You know, money can be used to build the kingdom. You know, it takes money to further the gospel and to send missionaries and to go places and build things for the Lord, right? You know, but the love of it is one of these things, like a thorn. Imagine these beautiful flowers and all these thorns begin to grow around this thing and just choke this thing out and, and so, so that the thorn bush becomes so big, no light's coming in. What would happen to that? It would die. And the deceitfulness of riches can do that. And so, those are other people we just talked about. Now we're going to talk about you. Everybody sitting here, I just speak this, I declare this over you. You are good soil. You are good soil, amen? 
Here's what, here's what Jesus said in verse 23. He said, but he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word. All right, the others were hearing the word, but something else is going to happen. And understands it. You begin to take it in. It begins to take root in you. Who indeed bears fruit. Now look at this next part. Not only does the good soil seed begin to grow out of that ground as it's watered and as it's taken care of, it's in that good soil, all the nutrition it needs, it begins to shoot up, you know, and if it's a flower or something or wheat, you know, it begins to look like what it's supposed to look like. But it then says, and produces some a hundredfold, some 60 and some 30. Now that sounds maybe unreasonable to you. How could you... You know, that's not a seed, that's my gum wrapper. How could you <laughs> plant a seed, you know, and, and expect this little thing to produce a hundred times more? You know, I, I did a little research and, and on, on the, uh, the, the seed of wheat, the wheat kernel. It is not a stretch for a seed planted in good soil to do 30, 60, or 100 fold. In fact, one grain of wheat can produce often 12 to 1,500 Grains of wheat in, in the generations of its, of its planting. That is amazing. And you, and you see, that's what the Lord wants to do with us. He, he wants to take us uh, from a place. I heard one preacher say it this way. He wants to, to take you like into a hospital as a sick person and not just heal you and get you better like you, when you go to the doctors, but he actually wants you to become a doctor and go out and heal other people and bring that new life that you've received into other people's lives. Well, the same thing with the seed here. As you begin to grow in the Lord, the idea is that you don't grow just for your sake, but you grow so that you can now uh, further the kingdom of God. As that seed that's planted in 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold, how many of you would love to be 100-fold uh, on your life? How many would love to see through your life 100 people come to the Lord? Do you have a vision for that? I mean, do you, I mean, not everybody's called. You know, there's different types of giftings, and some actually have the, the evangelistic calling, and you know those people, you know, because they're alive and they're wired, and, you know, they just can't stop talking about Jesus, you know. Uh, but all of us, all of us, whether you're an evangelist or not, all of us are called, in a sense, to be an evangelist. It is the Great Commission, right? To go into all the world, to spread the gospel. And so, again, I believe this is you today. You are the good soil. If you don't know Jesus today, today is a new day for you. You are going to encounter your Savior and make him your Lord today. I believe it. You're that good soil. God's will for your life is that you hear the word, receive the word, you believe the word, and then you act Amen. on the word. That seed that died, Jesus Christ, ultimately, was raised again to life, said that you might die to self and be raised to new life in Christ. God's plan for your life is to bear fruit, to produce many times more others coming into his kingdom. Do you believe that this morning? Amen. Do you have a heart for that? I mean, do you feel a stirring on the inside? You are that good soil. Amen? Amen. Bring us home, Pastor. All right. Hey, stay up here. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to have Garrett stay up here. We're going we're gonna to close the, the service. Um, I believe that, that this is your, your destiny. One of the beautiful things about being here today is that God's given you another day, yeah. right? You know, I think some, some of you might be at that point of, of decision. It's time to, to start making some changes in my life, kind of to renew a commitment. I'm going to just ask everybody to stand, and uh, I'm also... If uh, you would like to plant one of these seeds in the soil, I want you to feel free to do that while I'm talking. You could even come do it now. But um, I'm going to have Pastor Garrett pray for us in a minute. But I just, I want all of us to make a renewed commitment. I mean, do we all still have some growing to do, yeah. right? You know, things to learn. We need to start stepping out. We need to, and, and you've got to make a decision to be that, that good soil every day to water Water that seed, water that plant that's in the, in the soil. The seeds are right over here. Um, you know, because if it's not nourished, the plant's going to die. And, and you know what it feels like to be, to be a wilted plant, right? You know, it's, it's like you just, you have trouble even getting up because you're dealing with depression or, you know, broken relationships, whatever, physical things. You know, if, if you want to come up to the altar, feel free. Um, 
I want you all, even if you don't come up, to make a renewed commitment that, that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put the right foot forward and I'm going to start moving forward in the things of Jesus Christ. I'm going to, he's, he's, he's kind of been a little low on the priority list or he hasn't been number one. I'm going to make him number one on the priority list. And I'm going to dedicate my life to him. I'm going to rededicate my life to him. And I'm going to start making some changes in my life so I can be that good soil that doesn't just bear fruit for me, but so that you become a vessel of transformation. Because you are. God has transformed you, but he has not trans- transformed you just for you. You know, a, a good tree, you know, like the trees planted by streams of living water in Psalms, bears fruit and bears fruit in season. That fruit that you bear from your life is going to be picked off from other people and they're going to eat of that fruit because you're going to bring transformation in their lives because you have been transformed. So I'm just going to have Pastor Garrett pray for you and then I just want you to go enjoy your day and enjoy your families and enjoy the fact that Jesus Christ died for you. He rose from the dead to give you resurrection life and that, and that no matter what you think and what you've been told, he's got an incredible life in store for you and much more fruitful than you've ever been. For a believer, today, the next day is always the better day. We don't lament about the past. God's done good things in the past, but today is a new day, and there are bigger and better things in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. All right. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Father God, we just give you the glory today for what you have done. Lord, I just praise you and thank you for your faithfulness. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for what you have done for us, dying and rising again. We thank you that we serve a living God. We thank you, Lord, that that you love us so much. You you gave your, your life for us, Lord. We just thank you that every person who believes on you, who confesses you as Lord, believes that God raised you from the dead, will be saved. So, Lord, we just welcome you into our lives today. We thank you. We renew that commitment to you. Lord, we're not going to be choked out by the things of this world. We're not going to be choked out by the pleasures of this world. But we're going to, to follow hard after you with all of our heart, with all of our soul. We just declare that new today, on this day that we celebrate your rising from the dead. We give you the glory and the praise and the honor for who you are in the name of Jesus. Come on, let's just give a shout to the Lord this evening. Amen. Amen. Thank Amen. You. Hallelujah, Amen. Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Praise you, Lord. I just felt in my spirit the Lord speak to me and say, for some of you here, a number of you here, this is your day. Amen. This is your day. I just felt the Lord say, there's some here who are ready to open their heart to me. And as we close in worship, just come on up. We want to pray for you. You want to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. You want to experience a new life that only he can give. Come on up here, and we'll meet you and pray with you. And for the rest of you, happy Resurrection Day. God bless you.
street.